All right, good morning. Um, welcome. We're so glad you could join us today for this um, bringing the entre entrepreneurial mindset to education. This is one of my favorite topics, and I'm so glad I brought several of the experts in this uh, arena to chat with you all today. So we are going to dive into what this means in education, what the entrepreneurial mindset, how that can impact education. A lot of us don't typically think of educators and entrepreneurs as directly associated, but today we're going to discuss why having an entrepreneurial mindset can impact teaching, learning, and student outcomes. So just to clarify up front, we're not talking about creating more Mark Zuckerbergs in K-12 education today, but we do want to discuss a new way of thinking, reinforcing and making visible the importance of an entrepreneurial mindset and helping us to think and act differently in the face of challenge and opportunity. Really, it has nothing to do with starting a business, but it's about building those foundational skills for future students. So throughout our discussion today, we're going to use the, the word entrepreneurial mindset, but we encourage you to simply think of a mindset that considers resilience, persistence, problem solving, and micro experimentation as a starting point. So I want to welcome our spectacular panelists. And I could go on and on about introducing each of them, but I'd love for you to do that yourselves. Bobby, do you mind starting us, starting us off with a quick intro? Hi, I'm Bobby Kershan. I work at the University of Pennsylvania Graduate School of Education, and I am, have a wonderful title. It's called Innovation Advisor. So I get to do a lot of thinking, which is great. And I have a background in what I con consider the innovation ecosystem. I have spent a long time as a university professor. I have spent a considerable time equally as an investor running a private equity fund as well as an incubator. And then I have spent a lot of time working on the um, as an entrepreneur. So I've started both the nonprofit and for profit companies, took one all the way from uh, beginning to IPO on the UK stock exchange. So I have a lot of experience in thinking about what an entrepreneurial mindset would be. I live in Washington DC now, and I really enjoy this topic. And now I'm writing a book on what makes women um, on education entrepreneurs successful. What is their mindset? Thanks. Fantastic. Thank you. Welcome, Bobby. Um, if if you could share in the chat what you hope to get out of today's session, we would love to to learn more about who you are and what you're hoping to gain, and also what the word entrepreneur means to you as an educator. If you could just share those two things in the chat, we would love to hear more about that. Okay, and next up, uh, Gary, would you introduce yourself? Yeah, thank you, Sarah. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome. My name is Gary Shoniger. I'm the founder and CEO of the Entrepreneurial Learning Initiative. We uh, develop entrepreneurial mindset education, training, professional development programs for academic institutions, organizations worldwide. Uh, I started on this journey almost 30 years ago, trying to answer a very simple question, which is how do underdogs win? How do ordinary people who have no particular advantage in life manage to recognize to evaluate and to bring ideas to life in a way that benefit others and themselves. And so this is what kind of put me on the path to, to understanding the entrepreneurial mindset. We're also the creators of the Ice House entrepreneurship programs, which are being used in middle school, high school, colleges, universities, and nonprofit organizations worldwide. Fantastic. Thanks, Gary. Deborah, um, would you share who you are and what you're about? Sure. Uh, my name is Deborah Conrad. Um, I am with the Entrepreneurial Mindset Profile at the Leadership Development Institute at Eckerd College. So I am the product director for the EMP, the Entrepreneurial Mindset Profile. It's uh, an assessment, an online assessment tool that is based on um, research into the traits and motivations and skills of entrepreneurs. It's used by educators with students, um, leaders, entrepreneurs, HR teams, a wide range of folks, but it compares um, one's mindset on 14 different scales. 
that entrepreneurs and corporate managers were measured on to show the differences in the entrepreneurial mindset. So things like risk assessment, um, idea generation, nonconformity. But I work with the assessment, help with certifications, uh, trainings, practitioner support, client relations, marketing, business development, everything related to the EMP. Thank you, Le uh, Deborah. I appreciate it. And Liza, would you share, um, introduce yourself for us? Be short. Hi, I'm Liza Herzog, and I am, <clears throat> I don't remember after this year what I do for a living, but I do, I, I'm here at Drexel University. I am, I direct um, research evaluation and assessment for the School of Entrepreneurship. It's the only, for now, accredited School of Entrepreneurship. So we are a college within a university um, dedicated to entrepreneurship and innovation, about 200 plus undergraduate and graduate students. Um, I also teach, which is how I know Bobby, in the it, at the University of Pennsylvania Graduate School of Education in what was the first education entrepreneurship master's program launched in 2014. I am also myself an entrepreneur, having co-founded a nonprofit and worked in the nonprofit sector and in K-12 for almost like two decades or close to it. So I am, and, and I will be expanding on our use of the EMP. And that is how I know Deborah and am new to knowing Gary and Sarah through a entrepreneurial mindset symposium back in November, which I hope we saw some of you at. So greetings, thank you for being here. Yes, welcome. And I should mention that all of these lovely panelists have attended and been on my podcast, Build Momentum, where we explored this topic in a series on entrepreneurial education. And that's included in the resources if, in case you want to check it out. Okay, so um, we had we did get a couple of responses to our question, and I want to share them with all of you. It's starting something new. Is is Heather Fisher shared starting something new? That's what it means to her and, and Jan Elderman shared education entrepreneur equals someone reaching out to learn new ways and develop learning opportunities. Kelly Morcombe said taking charge of your education by doing what you can what you can every single day to move yourself forward with persistence. I love it. Well, that's a good starting point to really dig into the conversation today. So Gary, would you mind kicking us off? I would love for you to talk about what entrepreneurial learning has to do with K-12 education and how you define an entrepreneurial mindset. For example, I know you, I've heard you say many times, we should stop asking students what they wanna be when they grow up and start asking them what problems they wanna solve. So would you mind elaborating on that for us? I'd be happy to, Sarah. That's a lot to unpack, mm -hmm. but but let me, let, me, let me take a stab at that. But first I wanna say, I like to freely admit that I stole that line from Jaime Kassap, who's a former head of Google Education. But but so so it's not my thinking. I want to be very clear about that. But the comment resonates with me. Like, let's stop asking students what they want to be when they grow up. And let's ask them what problems they want to solve and what they need to learn in order to solve those problems. I mean, that comment really represents the fundamental shift that needs to occur in education. Um, and so I'm gonna to try to put together these two ideas. What is entrepreneurship and what is a mindset? And when we put these two ideas together properly, I think we, we can create a, a, a new way of thinking that can have a profound impact on, on the future of education. So, uh, you know, the world has changed in ways that I think now require everyone to think like entrepreneurs. And I'm emphasizing the word think because I do not mean that everyone should start a business per se. But when we look at entrepreneurial people, whether they work in established organizations or they own the business, what we see are people that are highly resilient, resourceful, they're creative, critical thinkers who can identify and solve problems in resource-constrained, ambiguous environments when no one is there to tell them what to do, where the rules aren't clear, the path is not clear, they're able to figure it out. Yeah. And, right, so, so like 
My point here is that these are the attitudes and skills the world now demands. Entrepreneurial skills are 21st century skills, right? These are the skills employers demand. So why do some people behave this way? Well, most of us don't. Like that's the really interesting question. And the theory I've, I've sort of cobbled together after 30 years of interviewing underdog entrepreneurs around the world and looking at the, the literature is that non-entrepreneurial behavior is learned. And that we're all born, like not everyone wants to start a business, but we're all born with the innate desire for autonomy, for mastery and purpose, right? As Karl Marx said, like the desire to fulfill human needs through our own effort is a power, it's part of what makes us human, right? So, you know, the word entrepreneur has become very popular recently, but, but the, the, the definition of it is antiquated and it's still steeped in, 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 in the culture and the belief system of the industrial revolution, right? And so, you know, our ability to, to embrace this concepts are, are limited by the ways in which we define it. Most of us think of an entrepreneur as a business person. And if you look up in the dictionary, if you look up the word entrepreneur, it's going to tell you somebody who takes the risk in exchange for a profit. That's grossly misleading and it completely undermines the intrinsic motivation to be innovative and entrepreneurial as a means of self-expression and freedom and autonomy and so on and so forth. But I don't want to get too far off track. I've simply defined entrepreneurship. I don't see it as a business discipline and I'm asking you all to sort of go with me, right? Like if you think of it as a business discipline, you're creating this binary. You either think of it as, you know, uh, uh, you're either gonna start a business or you're gonna become an employee. And that's not the way to think of it. I'm looking at it as a behavioral phenomenon. Why do some people behave this way where others don't? So I've redefined entrepreneurship in a very basic way. And it took me 25 years to do this but I'm defining it as the self-directed pursuit of opportunities to create value for others. And by creating value for others, we empower ourselves. And, and I don't mean empowered just in economic terms. I mean, in, in terms of psychological well-being. I mean, I'm I mean, in terms of the eudaimonic benefits of entrepreneurial activity, right? Let's pop in, Gary, and ask the question. So I'm curious from the group, how would you say this is relevant to your role in K-12? Is there a way that you can incorporate some of Gary's definition into, into your role in K-12? And I, I, I'm curious to hear in the chat what you guys think. So let's, while that's percolating, I would love to, thank you, Gary. Uh, Bobby, I'd love to understand, I've heard you talk about bridging these ideas within the classroom and the entrepreneurial mindset within the classroom, what do you believe are the key skills we need to equip um, our students with to help guide this, this mindset and this behavior? It's a good question and one that I guess we spent a lot of time talking about and as I had shared with you, I did a TED talk on entrepreneurial, entrepreneur, great entrepreneurs and great teachers are really very similar and they have a lot of the same uh, capabilities. I don't think that teachers in the classroom have go out and say, well, I'm gonna teach tomorrow. My, I'm gonna teach persistence or I'm, and, uh, or I'm gonna teach um, risk, you know, risk, or I'm gonna teach one of those skills that come under the entrepreneurial mindset profile. But I do think that teachers have a, an ability to help to model those skills. And this goes to a very important question for kids. Are entrepreneurs born or are they made? And I think teachers know when they, in a classroom, who kids are gonna be great leaders or kids that are gonna be able to be good followers or good team members or good collaborators. But how do you know whether a child in K through 12, whether they're five years old or whether they're 18 year old and graduating from college are going to have an entrepreneurial mindset. And I think we have to look at the way that we model that as teachers. 
What skills do they do? Do they take risks in the kind of assignments do they do? Do they take risks in their classroom? As a child in the fifth grade, does that child take a risk on the playground? What are their skill sets in being able to bring kids together? What is their self-confidence? And um, when they're not self-confident about being able to do something, how do they react? And more importantly, how do we as teachers react? So I think what kind of skills you need to teach in the classroom is we certainly are not going to say today we're going to have a um, lesson on execution. Today we're going to have a lesson on um, being um, ability to overachieve. Um, we, we're going to model that in the kind of things we do, and we're going to reward the students for the skills that we think we want to make better. So can entrepreneurs be be made? Yes, we can make a better entrepreneur. Can we make an somebody an entrepreneur that may not be an entrepreneur? Probably not. So I think teachers need to be aware of what the skills are we're looking for in an entrepreneurial mindset how we evaluate the growth around that. So there's a really nice connection between entrepreneurial mindset and growth mindset. How do we know when a child takes more risk? How can we as a teacher observe that? So I think in professional development for teachers, we need to make them aware of their mindset and how they are using that in the way they teach in the classroom. So every teacher in professional development and teacher training schools and in universities should probably take some kind of inventory of their own mindset, whether it's the EMP or the one from some of the other groups. We should be aware of our skills, which ones we're strong in and which ones we can model and which ones we need to think about not having that skill and how are we going to identify. So I think it's a three prong approach. We need to do better at teacher training. We need to do better at modeling, helping teachers model those skills in the classroom. And three, we need to be able to identify, call out for students when they are using that skill. We need to use language with, boy, you took a real risk by helping doing that on the playground you need to model what skills you want. And I think that's how we bring it in the classroom. We're certainly not going to have a class on entrepreneurial mindset. We might have a class on entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. So those are what I think need to be done. Thanks, Bobby. And just to clarify, EMP, would you define that for us, for those who don't know? So I'm going to let Deborah talk about it. But okay, that's... we will let Deborah talk about that, but that's coming up. Deborah will exactly. hit on that. Um, Deborah, <laughs> do you want to just share that real quick? And then I have a question for Liza define the EMP, what Bobby mentioned? Absolutely. So it's the entrepreneurial mindset profile. I'll put that in the chat. And mm -hmm. it, it's an assessment, an online assessment that takes about 10, 15 minutes to complete. And it does measure um, on 14 different scales that we've determined differentiate corporate managers and entrepreneurs. And entrepreneurs have ended up being higher on all of the scales except for one, but I'll save that as a, a cliffhanger um, should you decide to get certified or take it yourself. But you end up receiving a feedback report that shows you your mindset compared to these two norm groups. And it comes with a development guide. So you could, if you wanted to leverage a, an entrepreneurial strength where you may score high or if there's an area that you may want to develop, or if you're working in teams or uh, as part of a startup, you may want to find people with complementary skills. So it pretty much gives you that snapshot and allows for benchmarking. So we're not just talking about theory and there's actual concrete data. Perfect, thank you, appreciate sure. that. So Bobby, I just wanted to touch on one thing you said, I know, we when we were kind of preparing for this panel, we talked about how teachers are probably already doing all of this in the classroom today. And we, we don't want to make this panel feel like this is one more thing you should be thinking about and doing. We want to understand and recognize that you are working incredibly hard this year, harder than ever. And this is there, you're already doing this work. It's almost just pointing out all of the ways your students are taking risks and, and, and identifying those so that um, we acknowledge that those are there. You see what I'm saying, Bobby? <laughs> yes, absolutely. I, I, I think what I said implies mm -hmm. that, that I said we yeah. need to give teachers an awareness of the skills so they yeah. can label what they're already doing. It's not that exactly. they're not doing this, and in some ways they don't have a label for it. And we do that across all areas of, of teacher training. We want teachers to be able to identify what is 
best practices? What are the skills that they're using? And so we need to be able to identify them for them. But we certainly are not suggesting they don't already have them. It's much more of identification. And then how do we give them the skills to be able to identify and point that out to students in the language that they use in the classroom or in the activities that they do with students? Beautiful. Perfect. Thank you. Liza, I'd love to talk with you about, um, you're in the classroom every day teaching both entrepreneurship and you're teaching future teachers. How do you talk about this mindset and is it something you can teach? What are the key practices you're using to guide students through um, staying innovative and inspired to keep learning, but also teaching them the entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial mindset? Share more about that with us. Yeah, and, and and Bobby teed it up very well, as did Deborah, because I feel like I could bridge their, their two, um, the last two comments. So I failed to mention, and probably should have, what's most relevant to this panel, which is that I teach pre-service teachers, right? So this is my 11th year teaching um, secondary ed, you know, te in teacher ed here at Drexel. And I also teach entrepreneurship students, so I have this kind of strange nexus and I want to bring up what Gary talked about, problem-based education and, and ambiguous and sort of ambiguity and how different students who are both in entrepreneurship students and teacher ed students handle ambiguity far differently in my, my arc of observation. Um, put that over here before I answer Sarah's question. So I would say the way in kind of day-to-day, -day, it's neither explicit nor covert. It's what Bobby said, it's kind of, I reflect on and build my syllabus and my lesson plans for the term, actively thinking about what it means for what makes an entrepreneurial mindset, like across those seven skills, across those seven characteristics. So either we will take the EMP, the entrepreneurial mindset profile that Deborah just, um, just um, outlined, this I've done with undergraduate students, with graduate students who are both majoring in entrepreneurship and innovation. I'll be doing it next week with undergrads majoring in information science. We did it with nurse educators last week. So professionals kind of cross sector, teachers, current teachers inside of the entrepreneurship, entrepreneurial education master's program different settings where you'll either do a pre post and sort of set it up. So in mind will be these facets of what makes for an entrepreneurial mindset. Then as Bobby mentioned, you got to make it visible almost every day. So for resilience, you know, you might make it so that you give permission to resubmit everything the whole semester. You might be flexible in the design of assessments so that you're kind of thinking about idea generation in the back of your mind. You're not kind of a lot of my teacher, my my um, education students say, tell me what to do. Tell me, you know, give me the give me the rubric, right? And so instead of we co-design a rubric or co-design that choice set of what makes for the projects that we'll be doing for execution, what makes you kind of a little bit uncomfortable? Get out of the building, start collecting data for my entrepreneurship students on future customers. If that doesn't do some early prototype testing, even if you don't have the materials, get out of the Zoom room, get out of the building. We did that last term in ways that might have felt strange because it was such a weird, you know, they thought, what do you mean talk to customers? Well, let's figure out how to do that. Show mock-ups on a website. So those in those ways, when I say neither covert nor explicit, it's baked into the syllabus in ways where I am modeling either verbally and or through activity that is co-constructed by and through the classroom. And I'm going to stop there. That's great. Thank you. Thanks, Liza. Deborah, let's talk about the EMP. I'd love to hear, I know you work with educators to help them incorporate the entrepreneurial mindset. Would you break this down a little bit more? I know you shared a little bit, but even how this could look in the classroom and why it would be something they'd want to apply in the classroom? Absolutely, absolutely. So one of the things that we offer is certification. So if you would like to use the EMP either with your students or for yourself and colleagues, uh, if you're an administrator, but like her, uh, Liza is and like Bobby is um, a certified EMP practitioner, you could use the EMP as the framework that you want to build upon to help the students 
uh, explore what they may or may not want to do, where their strengths lie, how they possibly can leverage those strengths, or maybe realize they have strengths in an area that they hadn't thought about before. Um, so by introducing the 14 scales and talking about the differences between the entrepreneurs and the corporate managers, it will allow them, if you then also share, for example, you take the EMP, now you have this framework and this common language where you can build a conversation. You can lead discussions about the differences, about where the students fall. There are all kinds of activities you can do. Liza, I know you had back in the day when we were in person, students stand up and cross the room so you could group people together. And then you can discuss likenesses or differences in terms of where your mindset may be and, and be thinking about how can that help me in certain situations and make it real and not just theory, right? Because everybody can relate to COVID. We all had to be resilient. We all had to pivot. We had to think outside of the box. We had to react. And so when you think about EMP scales like action orientation, idea generation, risk acceptance, yes, you know, for those of us who might be perfectionists, there was that fear of failure, but you had to do it. And so by discussing what these scales mean and how they impact everyday life, again, doesn't necessarily have anything to do with you needing or wanting to start a business, but to be successful in this day and age for your organization, for society, whatever it is, that entrepreneurial mindset is important. So it's good to know where you're at where you can leverage strengths and where you may want to develop or complement. So. Yeah, I agree. Thank you, Devra. Bobby, I'm curious, how do you feel this mindset creates a powerful incentive to learn for students, particularly for those who may be struggling, especially this year, uh, getting back on track? Oh, that's a good question because I'm not I'm not convinced that any of the labels and things that we put on it, you know, whether you take, you know, the, the quiz in the teen magazine that says, you know, who you're going to date. I think we have to be careful of labeling something and say, well, if you understand this, then you, you're going to do X, Y, or Z. But I think we have, as Deborah just said, we need an awareness. So I think in answer to your question, I think that as students are aware of this, they're going to be more conscious of what they do well. And if we can say to them, you know, you really can do this by identifying the self-confidence. So we help students and the student helps themselves by being aware of their skills and that we, we acknowledge their confidence in some things and we acknowledge that they might not have confidence to try it. So you hear teachers all the time saying, you can do this, try it. Well, I'm not sure that always works because if my self-confidence in my mindset is a, low, a lower than some of my other skills, so we have to be able to help the student understand where they fall and where their their level of confidence. And we need to say that my daughter had a teacher that used to say, it's not a matter of whether you can do it or not do it. She's always said, you can just do better. And she asked my teacher, she, the teacher had a class and asked her um, kids what they should put on their license plates when you could get vanity license plates. And the teacher and my daughter raised her hand and said, you should put do better on your license plate. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. I love that. So um, anyway, so I think there are ways that kids can be do do better if they have mm -hmm. some understanding. And we need to, to help them see which things they can work at with things they need to improve. And by the way, we have to make them very, very clear that if you don't, you're not an overachiever or you're not good on execution, you can get help to do that. You don't have to be the best at all of these things. I tell people in interviewing for the book, these are scales. There's not a right or wrong. It doesn't matter what end of the scale you came in. It's a scale that you have to figure out how to use and live within. And I think we need to make children aware that there's a scale. And I do think there's a lot of connection between growth mindset and the work of Angela Duckworth and what she does around persistence and resilience. She will tell you that she has no curriculum for teaching this. And if you read any of her works, 
she's always talking about modeling and how you can show people. And I think that's what kids have to do. And we have to help them identify what their, how their friends are modeling. Because remember, so much of the learning goes on peer-to-peer -peer learning, not what the teacher in the front of the classroom does. Yeah. Oh, that's great. That's great. So um, I want to just open it up. I know we are not getting a uh, lot of responses to our question about K-12, but if anyone has other questions or wants to engage with the panelists, we're totally uh, willing to open this up to general conversation. So pipe up if you want to chat and um, we'll call on you. Okay, Gary, I have a question for you. So you, the Entrepreneurial Learning Initiative works with so many economic development organizations employing this mindset. I'd love to take this to a higher level from the schools and talk about the potential outcomes that could result from employing this mindset if we start even younger, I mean, let's talk about the amazing results you've seen uh, it, through your organization. So, yeah, let me back up for a second. I want to, I want to uh, uh, sort of finish my answer from the first oh, question. Sorry. Like wh yeah. when, when, when people ask me like, what is an entrepreneurial mindset? I sometimes respond by saying, well, that's an interesting question. Tell me what is a non-entrepreneurial mindset. Mm -hmm. So, so what is that? What is it? What does it mean to be non-entrepreneurial? And that's a powerful question. And I, I ask the question because it gets at the mindset that we're operating. You know, I define a mindset as a pattern of beliefs, assumptions, and mental models that are learned by an individual that have worked well enough that we assume to be the correct way to think and feel, right? And, you know, Liza, you said something that just startled me. It, it speaks to this point, which is, you know, the students are coming up to you saying, tell me what to do, tell me what to do, tell me what to do. That is a non-entrepreneurial mindset. And there are no courses in school that teach the employee mindset because it's embedded, it's implied. And so, you know, again, this is, so, so think about mindset as our individual beliefs, these deeply held, mostly unconscious beliefs, assumptions, and mental models. Well, culture is our collective mindset, right? And so the minute we set foot in school, it's more or less assumed that we're going to work in an established organization where the useful thing has already been figured out by someone else. And we're going to be expected to fulfill a predetermined role within that organization. And so the, the point that I really want to get to here, Sarah, is that it's so deeply embedded in our individual and collective consciousness the employee mindset, the expectation that we are going to learn, that someone else will determine what we need to learn and do in order to be successful in life. And that is the fatal flaw in the assumption in a modern world. And I think that's what we need to shift. And that's what Jaime Kassab's comment gets at, right? Stop assuming, like the assumptions of, of, of standardized education are such that we're going to learn and function and work in, in other directed, routinized environments. And that world no longer exists. And what students need now is to figure out how to make themselves useful to other humans outside of a known curriculum guided by professional teachers within its, you know, with the, that assumes linearity and predictability. And, and, you know, I'm pushing back a little bit on the dispositional uh, assumptions that we make about entrepreneurship. And, and I want to bring into, into context or into focus the, the nature of the context, right? What do I mean by this? Like, well, People say, well, entrepreneurs, are, are they have a high risk tolerance. Well, that's a situational factor, right? If you hate your job and you can't easily replace it, 
you're going to have a different tolerance for risk than if you love your job and you're well paid, right? So there are contextual factors. The point that I really want to make here, Sarah, is that, you know, we, we, we tend to default to trait-based assumptions about entrepreneurs. That they're, 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 the economist Frank Knight described the entrepreneurial decision-making process as a scientifically unfathomable mystery. But what I've come to believe through, through research, mostly in social psychology, is that, is that it's the compelling nature of the goal that they're pursuing acts on the individual, right? And, and so it, it's, you know, at a glance, we look at an entrepreneur, we just say, oh, Sarah's really passionate. She's really dedicated. She's really focused. She's really disciplined. Well, that doesn't tell the whole story. Sarah's personality profile doesn't tell the whole story mm -hmm. until you understand the nature of the goal Sarah's pursuing and her relationship to that goal. Again, that gets back to Jaime Kassab's comment. Stop asking students what they want to be because it implies linearity, other directed, well-known, established versus what problems do you want to solve and what do you need to learn? The shift in Jaime's question or comment is very, very simple. It's shifting from other directed to self-directed learning, from other directed value creation to self-directed value creation. That's what every single student is going to need to learn to adapt and thrive. That's what employers want. Those are the skills the world demands. Okay. Sorry for the rant. I just wanted to kind of follow yeah. up. On, no, and on I'm that. sorry I interrupted you, Gary. I apologize. Um, no, no, no. I, I mean, it was a two-part thing. I wanted to get the mindset connected to entrepreneurship, right? The desire yeah. to fulfill human needs is in all of us. That's a very powerful force. The entrepreneurial spirit is the human spirit. And it's not just in some of us, it's in all of us. So, mm -hmm. and I think Bobby and, 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 and Liza, your comments have got, kind of spoken to that of like, how do we model this? Yeah. Uh, this behavior. We're getting a couple comments, Gary. I just wanted to share with you. Kelly Morcombe said, so true, Gary, when you break those paradigms, you can open to the growth mindset. It allows children to discover and explore on their own to do exactly what you said about asking what problems they want to solve in the world today. So, so Sarah, I, you know, I've got a, a paper I'm just right in the middle of reading right now, and I'll try to put it in the comments, but entrepreneurship, self-organization, and eudaimonic well-being, a dynamic mm -hmm. approach mm -hmm. by uh, Navdav Shear and Carol D. Riff. Uh, I'll, I'll try to copy that and put it in the chat, the title of this paper. It really speaks to the developmental benefits of entrepreneurship. And, and when we think of entrepreneurship in education, the word entrepreneur conjures an economic outcome. Mm -hmm. I want to make money. And that's deeply misleading. And we overlook the developmental. And even in the entrepreneurship education programs I see in colleges and universities, they favor the economic outcome at the expense of the developmental outcome. In this paper, they identify autonomy, self-acceptance, purpose, environmental mastery, positive relations, personal growth. Those are really important outcomes of entrepreneurship education that are neglected. So thank you, Sarah. Yes. Liza, did you have a comment there? I, you might want to respond to that. <laughs> yeah, I, I just want to recognize that that states, at least in Pennsylvania, where I am, um, through the Pennsylvania Department of Education and our, you know, standards aligned system. So those frameworks within which teachers operate, do, they do recognize as a standard area, you know, and I'm actually reminding myself of the characteristics that are kind of guided that, that the state has laid out. This is back in 2010, updated last year, character traits of successful entrepreneurs, adaptability, creative thinking, ethical behavior, leadership, positive attitude, and risk taking. I say that because through grade bands starting in kindergarten, 
there are ways in which the state, as we often think of, oh, do this, do this, and here's a, you know, here's a rubric, has been fairly forward, and in my mind, forward thinking as a guide to, with a caveat that these standards tend to live in career ed and work rather than in kind of the more common, you know, kind of secondary ed grade. But you look far enough and deep enough, you can both incorporate into and use as guidance for your own um, classroom setting. So for instance, and I'll just give one example, you know, there a standard is discussing you know, is discussing the steps entrepreneurs take to bring goods or services to market. So meaning production, research and development, selection, you know, marketing at the level of, you know, that is appropriate developmentally for um, various groups of students. That said, is there room to, you know, A, what it, the awareness around and professional development that actually is focused and or based on or around the, you know, uses these standards, leverages these standards in some way, I think is 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 lean or light. So when I started prospecting and look, I'm thinking like Pennsylvania's been here, at least at that level. We're here in classrooms all day, every day, right? Teachers are doing and an entrepreneurial and teacherpreneurs all over, you know, since time immemorial. But I wanted to make clear that there are places to go both at school level with problem-based education happens here in many forms in many in public across school types where there's an essential question you're doing kind of learning by design or universal de design where you're you know starting with the outcome uh, and or a problem from which you are learning over the course of a marking period or a full school year so i'm going to just I wanted to just name those structures that are in place organizationally for educators that um, exist both at the state, school, and classroom level. Sarah, can I add something there? I think Absolutely. that there, we need to think about the fact that, as you know, Liza just said, we want to go back to having experiences where they immerse themselves in that kind of thinking. So there are examples of K through 12 schools that are entrepreneurship schools and they everything is built around creating entrepreneurial mindset in PBL and building entrepreneurs. But I think that the problem is we need to flip teacher education on its head. And instead of having teachers or people apply to schools of education to study elementary education or you know, math, they need to come in and, and as Gary said, they need to tell us what problems they want to solve. Then right. it's exciting education. We need to say to the, to the teacher, I want to solve the literacy problem, or I want to solve the, the problem of clean water in, in my community. And then you can take them through a science education program. So they get the courses they need while during the course of the, the, the graduate program, they're actually over the year and a half or two years that they're getting their masters, they're actually solving that problem. So at the end, they deliver that solution with to the school or the division that they go to. And the faculty doesn't teach in you know distinct courses in classroom management and you know design thinking. Instead, the classes are run as seminars. And when I need to go take a class on how to teach reading to solve the literacy problem, then it's part of my curriculum. We're, we've got it all wrong. We're asking kids to come in and teach fourth grade. Well, why? What's exciting about that? What problem are they solving? And as an entrepreneur, that's the first thing we ask. Don't bring me a solution until you've defined the problem. I have so many solutions I see, as I'm sure Liza sees and all the time. People come in and say, I've developed this great tool to teach reading. And I look at them and say, but what problem are you solving with your tool? So we need to do the same thing in teacher education. We need to do the same thing in how we build schools of the future. And COVID has just made this so much more interesting because we have now become more dependent on peer-to-peer -peer learning. We've become more dependent on collaboration. We have to change the way we assess kids. So. I'm afraid what's going to happen is we're going to go back to the old normal and the new normal is just going to be what we were doing before and not what we now have the opportunity to change around entrepreneurial thinking, both from how we think ourselves and how our students think. 
Yeah. So Sarah, I, I want to kind of pile on what Bobby's saying because I, I love this thread. Yeah. And and I, you know, I, I think this could be helpful to the folks that are on this on this in this session that that you know entrepreneurial learning is discovery learning. And it's distinct from traditional learning, which is the transfer of explicit knowledge, either through a book, through a lecture, or whatever. And I think this is what we need to embrace, that, that it's discovery learning. Like the OECD, others have, have you know, said that we, we need to embrace informal and non-formal learning. And I've interviewed 500 entrepreneurs from across the globe over the last decade. Most of them were mediocre students at best, but they're learning machines. Right. I just I just interviewed a guy yesterday for my podcast, a former felon. He's been out of prison for a year. He's starting a business. He's just learning all over the place. He's on YouTube. He's networking. He's reading books, which he figured out how to do in solitary confinement. Right. So so I think it's important that we need to look at entrepreneurial people and how they learn. They're mirroring like organic learning. When the goal is compelling, he who has a strong why to live can endure almost any how. And that's what's missing. That's what I'm coming back to Jaime Kassab's comment. If you have a compelling problem that you want to solve, you'll find a way. And, and you look at the literature, like neurologically, when we're trying to solve a compelling problem, our brains are able to access unprecedented problem-solving abilities that are otherwise not available to us when we're engaged in routinized other directed work. And so again, we assign this to a disposition, somebody's a genius, and we overlook these contextual factors. So my, my point is that entrepreneurial learning is discovery learning. It's experiential, it's problem-based, it's peer-to-peer -peer learning, and it's self-directed learning. These are terms that are familiar to educators. I'm not saying we need to burn down the building and bulldoze it and start over. I'm just saying we need to start infusing discovery learning. And, and look, I want to say one more thing. When we're encouraged to pursue our natural interests and develop our natural abilities, in ways that contribute to the greater good, we become optimally engaged. In the intersection of those three spheres is where we tap into the most potent form of human motivation known, right? So Bruce Lee said this thing about the, the successful warrior is an ordinary person with a laser focus. I'm saying the successful entrepreneur is an ordinary person with a compelling goal. And by asking students what they want to, what problems they want to solve, we start to tap into that intrinsic desire to learn. And at that point, you all know this, but your jobs become not only much more rewarding, but much more, uh, much easier. But in order to, in order to tap into this intrinsic motivation, we have to set aside the tools of coercion. We have to lay down the carrots and the sticks and the gold stars and the letter grades because these extrinsic motivators undermine intrinsic motivation. And that's what Liza, your comment spoke to, like, tell me what to do. That's an extrinsically motivated student. Yeah. Gary, I want to uh, share, Kelly is saying, totally agreeing with you and saying yes, and the journey is the best part. When we allow children to explore what drives them, that brings a natural passion that they have within their purpose. It can absolutely be brought in the classroom and meet standards while still allowing the kids to dream about what problems they want to solve. That's right. That's it. Yeah. Sarah, and Deborah, to, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Exactly what I, all, all of you are saying, but pulling it together in terms of from the educator standpoint of modeling and making that discovery learning possible involves creating that safe environment, especially when we're talking about younger kids, K through 12, that they need to see themselves reflected 
in in what you're discussing. And so by doing something as simple as as sharing, having everybody share something about themselves, something maybe people didn't know or something that they're good at that maybe people find odd or allowing people to freely share and make that um, make that safe environment. So then it's not about, Bobby, I think you had mentioned putting people in boxes or labeling, or it, it allows everybody to then be generating ideas and discussing and seeing where you can come together or the commonalities or where you can leverage those differences. Yeah, 100% yeah. agree, Deborah. That self-confidence is huge. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And we want to make sure people, if they have questions for our panelists, please ask them. In, uh, and if we don't have questions, we're going to just share one more um, final piece of, I want to hear from each of you panelists. We want to make this practical. So I'd love for you each to share ideas on what educators can do in the classrooms today to inspire this thinking. And you've shared some of that, but if there's one final piece of advice that you could give to make this really applicable, that would be fantastic. Bobby, do you mind if I start with you? Sure. I think we have to have fun with this. My advice mm -hmm. is to not let it overwhelm you, but to, yeah. because I think part of the entrepreneurial spirit is enjoyment and passion. That's one of the skills we didn't talk about. So if you're not having fun and you're not passionate, then you probably are not going to be very able to apply entrepreneurial mindset. So I think that I want to leave the teachers on the people on the call that you should be passionate and have fun with this. Yeah. How about you, Liza? A word would be reflect. We don't give ourselves time to reflect. And I say that, I mean, in a very purposeful way. And so I build that in. I try to coursework, which feels like a, this like bubble space, because then you're kind of allowed to do a lot with time that you may not otherwise do. Don't think of it, you know, think of it as porous, where the course is the world is that, you know, to me, it's, it's all applied. You're living inside of a course, you're living, that should be a very easy transition. We tend to think in these, that's here, this is there, but reflect. And to me, that's, the, the, the emotion of kind of the cycle of continuous improvement and continuous, um, I guess, reimagining and and design redesigning one's own um, both curriculum, instruction, and experience for yourself and your students. And just one comment on what Bobby mentioned. I always say, you know, it's both it's, it's educator to student, content to student, student to student, which student to student to me feels most prominent or peer to peer. And so I try to also really keep that um, top of mind. Yep. Yeah, that's good advice. How about you, Gary? So it's a good question, Sarah. It's hard to answer simply about, I'll keep it simple. You know, let, let's, let's, let's remember that we're all in the, in the business of lecturing birds on how to fly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. And, and so what I mean by that is, is that we, we seem to have lost sight of the fact that humans are no different from other mammals in that we're all born with the innate desire and the capability to learn everything we need to learn in order to adapt and thrive in our environment. And we can't see how our constant interference undermines that natural ability. So what can teachers do? Sarah, I'm going to default to Jaime Kassab. <laughs> Stop asking students what they want to be. Let them self-organize in small teams of two or three people. Allow them to solve problems that they care about in the real world with minimal, with, it's a minimally invasive process. Mm -hmm. Show them relatable social you know, examples of other people who have done it. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Deborah, what's your advice? Yep. And and on that note for that figuring out the natural tendencies and doing that exploration and working with other students to talk about it and thinking about real world examples. So I love we have one practitioner who had her students 
look at, at the, the scales and for independence, one person went on a date to a restaurant by themselves because they were trying to develop independence or for risk acceptance, being willing to cook a new dish because they were really afraid of screwing it up, like thinking of something real world that isn't necessarily huge and lofty, but where it can really be applied to make it hit home that this entrepreneurial mindset can be used everywhere in all kinds of circumstances, but make it resonate for the students and for the educators and being able to share that. That would be my suggestion is sharing and having yeah. that conversation. Yeah, that's great. Well, we don't have a ton of questions yet. So I want to ask another one that um, just an additional bonus question. So we, we, a lot of us talk about failure based learning. And this is f failing forward is a hot topic right now. K 12 is less there's less of an emphasis on this because it's more about getting kids not to fail than encouraging failure. How do we sort of employ this mentality in in the K-12 environment where we're, you know, our goal is to get kids to to get good grades. That's the goal of a teacher. Um, how do we encourage failure based learning in this environment? Sir, I, I got to chime in here. It, it's a yeah. question poses the, the, the classic conundrum. Mm -hmm. Right. How do we tap into intrinsic motivation in a system that's reliant upon extrinsic rewards right, right? and and you know i call it error-based learning but that's how organisms learn in ambiguous dynamic environments yeah it's it's micro experimentation trial and error that is going to be the way forward for for students that's going to be the world as, as the as the rate of you know, complexity increases, that's going to be the way for error-based learning. Right. But it's completely at odds with the K-12 incentive structure that disincentivizes this. My dear friend, Tony Wagner is fond of saying, you know, innovation demands it error and education punishes it. What do we do though, Gary? So how do teachers start to incorporate in the classroom do you have any thoughts on what they could do? Well, it, it comes back to like, you know, look, I, I, I can't tell you like one single thing behind the, yeah. the kind of something I already yeah. said, but, but like every classroom starting in kindergarten should have a Venn diagram. And in one sphere are your natural interests, things you're naturally interested in. Mm -hmm. The second sphere is your it, capabilities, what you're capable of becoming good at. In the third sphere, is is the needs of the other humans mm -hmm. right and in that sphere in that when the overlap of those three like our job as teachers is to facilitate the discovery of that intersection what mm -hmm. are you capable of, what are you interested in and what are you capable of coming good at and how can you serve how can you contribute to the greater good with your interest and your abilities. Yeah. Entrepreneurs Sarah, are just stumbling into that trifecta. Yeah. I think, Sarah, that the the what Gary's saying is right. And I like the Venn diagram idea, but I think that this is a, a also a top-down approach. I think until we change the assessment systems in our mm -hmm. schools, we're not going to be able to um, change the way we teach and learn. So we have to right. look at how we assess success, how we assess growth, how we success um, and how we do that. And that means changing from our traditional fact driven testing. I mean, we've always teach, as Gary said, we teach to the students, we give them knowledge, we pour it into them, and then we ask them to regurgitate it back. We don't ask them to think about it. We don't ask them to problem solve about it. And no matter how many years I've been training teachers in education and entrepreneurs, we, they want that. And it's the interesting, it's a, it's an inverse relationship to what they want as direction. The kindergartner you have no problem with. He's going to go out and think, you know, entrepreneurial, innovative, creatively. Get in a master's class or a doctoral program, and the first thing the student asks you is, well, how long does the paper need to be? And how many resources do I have to need? And how many references? Because they're already been geared up to be evaluated, and those are the criteria we've given them to evaluate. 
And so we're guilty as the professors or the teachers of, of perpetuating a non-innovative environment or a non-entrepreneurial environment because we're putting them into to these criterion blocks. So until we change the assessment system, we're going to have a hard time getting kids to feel comfortable being creative and entrepreneurial because that we don't give them value for that. Yeah. So, so to piggyback on what Bobby's saying, you know, I've said this many times in our, in our, you know, every teacher I've ever met is dedicated and passionate about impacting lives. But I don't think they fully understand the, the forces, the motivational forces of gravity that they're working against them. <laughs> And I designed you might a now. You might after this year. <laughs> well, well, you know, my, my, to, to Bobby, to your comment, like I have a thought experiment, right? And it applies to higher education, but you get the idea. And it goes like this. Imagine you're the president of XYZ College. And it's June or it's May of 2021. And you're looking at the graduating class of 2023. And you're saying, ladies and gentlemen, today's your lucky day. We're handing out your diploma today. You don't have to come back. We think you should. There's some really interesting things here, but here's the degree. You don't have to come back. How many students are going to return in the fall? I don't know. Scott McNeely, who I worked for when I was running Kariki, used to say that we shouldn't get kids to pay for college until they finished and they thought that that was worth it what they had to be paid. So skin in the game. Yeah. Yeah, skin of the game. So, so you get it. I mean, we'll never know what the number is, but it's probably a low number. And, and Liza, it speaks to your comment. The, the student telling me what to do, what do I got to do to get the A? That's a little circus pony that knows what to jump through the hoop to get the answers. But I'm worried about... Pardon me? It's hard, work. it's hard work to be an entrepreneur and to think entrepreneurially. It's not yeah. given to you. There are no rules, and even though... Lies are put in the, you know, the boundaries of the state of Pennsylvania's one. That's not easily definable. We can't say, well, if you do this, then you're an entrepreneur. We can say if you take all these classes and you get 130 credits, you get a degree in a bachelor's degree. There's no connection between what you the skills we're teaching you in school and what you're going to do. I mean, it's right. like looking for a job. I would love for and as a computer scientist, we haven't been able to do this, but if we could use neuro thinking or chaos theory to map course syllabi to job descriptions, we'd find out that there's an amazing disconnect. So mm -hmm. we take kill kids through these skills that they learn in college classes and get a degree in engineering. And then we look at a, a, the application for an engineer. None of those are the skills that are listed on the application. Right. Yeah. So I want to share Aileen Swenson commented, I think encourage students to get outside of their comfort zone plays a huge role in this as well. She'd like to understand or he I'm not sure if it's sorry if I pronounced your name wrong, but getting students outside of their comfort zone. Is that something you'd agree is part of this? She, thank you. She. hundred percent. But how do you do that? Do you do that with carrots and sticks or do you do that with intrinsic motivation? That's the mm -hmm. question. Hey, Liza, yeah. Well, I want to comment on, on Bobby's comment. So Drexel is what's called a co-op school, for those of you who may not know, which is we are six months in the classroom. And I put that out there because we are very unique. Six months in coursework, six months in the workplace. We, meaning the you know, are the close school of entrepreneurship, works very closely with our co-op office to co-opt our program learning outcomes and our course level of outcomes to our employer surveys, meaning all of what we ask of our employers and we have thousands of employers with whom we work where our students are going from the classroom to the workplace and back throughout their whole time at Drexel. That's why people come here. It's called the five three. So it's five terms in class, five, three terms, six month terms um, with an employer. Those questions, you know, the, the, we, we purposefully design the assessment of the experience to map directly onto our academic program level outcomes at the behest of the employer. 
so that if it's around opportunity recognition, if it's around resilience, if there are question banks around self-sufficiency, I mean, so that they not only explicitly parallel the entrepreneurial mindset facets, because I write the questions and that, that is how we both market and live out our program. When, when um, Gary mentioned, oh, there's no course in entrepreneur so in entrepreneurial mindset, we do have courses in entrepreneurial mindset, but yes, we are at the, the higher ed you know, level. We also have entrepreneurial practice. We have ready, set, fail. There are courses that absolutely not only celebrate, but encourage failure, but you could think about it as, oh, you're inside of a course. So on both of those points, I just wanted to mention, we work very closely with employers to co-create outcomes that employers care about and that we think that we also um, kind of activate inside of our our courses in you know from our course level outcomes and then how do our assessments map up to match up to the each outcome and why and how does each student feel so this is like a part of our accreditation process and we're kind of on the the, the bleeding edge of that because we're the first and only school of entrepreneurship that has been accredited by the American Association of Schools and Colleges of Business because no one knows what to do with us and so I'm just that is part of that coming into, I think, the four that I hope is much more common than we than we think. But I just wanted to make that comment on both points. Yeah. You know, oh, go ahead, uh, Gary. Uh, uh, I work with a, a college system uh, in Mexico, Tecnológico de Monterrey. There's maybe 120,000 students. They're one of the top five entrepreneurial universities in the world. And I, I, I you know, their mission is to graduate all students with an entrepreneurial mindset with a humanistic outlook, which it just practically gives me shivers every time I hear that. But, and, and by the way that, you know, 15,000 of their students have been through our Ice House entrepreneurship program. But, you know, here's an example of what, what a, a unique uh, a training they do. Incoming freshmen, uh, are, are given 1,000 pesos, asked to self-organize in groups of two or three, maybe four, I've forgotten all the details. They're given 1,000 pesos in like 48 or 72 hours. Like get the hell out of here and come back with, try to come back with more than 1,000 pesos. That's it. There's no instruction. There's no teacher telling them what to do or how to do it. And, you know, I spent a lot of time at, at multiple campuses there in Mexico City, in Monterrey, in, 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 in other parts of the country. I've never seen, I've never been on a college campus where you can sort of viscerally feel the teachers getting out of the way. Like the, the, the teachers assume that these young, naive students can figure out things that the teachers cannot, right? And, and I had the, the chance in, in, in a project I did with, with tech is I got to interview, you know, maybe a, a eight or 10 groups at, at the Monterey campus in, in a recording studio and, and interview these groups. And what shocked me more than anything, and, and keep in mind, they didn't have, they weren't privy to each other's interviews. They came in, did an interview and left. And almost all of them said the way this experience, they talked about the chaos of it. They didn't know what the heck they're trying to this, trying to that, you know, the chaos of the uncertainty, ambiguity. But I was shocked when, they, when these students kept saying something to the effect of, as a result of that experience, I no longer allow the teacher to set the bar for me. I decided I was gonna master whatever the subject matter was. I stop asking, what do I have to do to get the A? Now, we've struggled, Gary, with the same issue with our entrepreneurship and education program, which I, which I helped found. Um, so we're on our going into our eighth cohort now. We have a capstone project, which is supposedly like an entrepreneurship lab, where they have to create their own um, whatever they're going to create, whether it be an entrepreneur project or an extra entrepreneur project. And they have to do that um, pretty much based on this few guidelines. 
we struggle constantly between how much we give them to support that and, and how much we give in the academic program. And we have a pretty rigorous academic program. Clearly it's at Penn and therefore there's some guidelines that Penn requires for rigor in getting a master's degree. And the Dr. Jenny Zaff, who runs the program now and is a wonderful leader, she and I are constantly, and Liza's had the same conversation, we are constantly struggling with how much handholding we do for them creating their entrepreneurship project or their capstone project. And they always come back and they want more and more. They want us to tell us that they're doing it right. And there's no grade. I mean, they have to turn something in. It's a pass fail kind of experiment, but it is very, very difficult to do what you said Monterey does. And we also work with Monterey Tech um, in our program and we did a global seminars together with them. So I think that it's a, it, again, it goes back to the instructor's lack of letting go. Um, we, it's very hard to let go because our great instructors at Penn, they want guidelines. They want to know that they can come in and teach what they're used to teaching and say they're done. They get, you know, it's the, that's their class. We have, we've worked very hard to integrate all our courses, but they're still pretty much standalone courses. We give a course in finance, we give a course in teaching and learning, we give a course on entrepreneurship, but the professors don't even talk to each other half the time. So no. we work very hard to do that. And yet we can't just let the students won't let go. And we say, gosh, you're free. You can do whatever you want in this capstone project. So yeah. you, you're struggling as we are with, I think the essence of this problem, it, it goes to ha uh, the letting go issue for all of us to be an entrepreneur. We don't have the answers, but the students want us to have the answers. We want them to discover the answers. Oh, yeah. yeah, that's a yeah. great way to end this. Go ahead, Gary. We have three minutes. <laughs> Liza, okay. do you have something, Liza? Really quick, I wanna just, capture that notion of common planning time that is not done much inside of higher ed. We have done what is called faculty forum here at Drexel, which mimics that group sharing and reflection among educators that is lost. So, it, thank you, Liza. Bobby, I want to piggyback on something you said that, that you know, the, the problems I see in K-12 education or, or, or 6-12 more, more accurately, or even in higher ed, I get this is also true in higher ed. There's a failure to distinguish between entrepreneurship and business management. And, and, you know, okay, you want to start a business? Great. Come on in, sit down. We're going to teach you how to write a business plan, learn about finance, economics, blah, 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 blah. Those are all skills that are needed for managing a business, but they're actually toxic to the entrepreneurial process of discovery. And, and, you know, my, my point here is that part of what, how we're going to fix this is that we have to disentangle entrepreneurial attitudes and skills from managerial attitudes and skills, right? The purpose of a business is to replicate and distribute useful things into the world. But the purpose of entrepreneurship is to discover useful things. And there's almost no overlap in the attitudes and skills. They're, they're quite distinct. That, that's the, the, the point I wanted to make. Yeah, that's a great point. Anyone else want to share anything, final thoughts in our last two minutes? Great this has been discussion. A, this has been great discussion. Yes, thank you so much, all of you. There's many resources in the file section of the, um, the session description. It, there's a there's a bunch of resources in there, including Bobby mentioned her TED talk and a study she Bobby shared, um, the EMP work, and all of the contact information for the panelists is there as well. And e Eli Mindset, Gary shared their link as well. So reach out. Gary has a book that he's written. Um, Gary, eight lessons well, from an unlikely well, entrepreneur. Yeah, yeah. And yes, so that yeah, here I'll yes. put that in the chat. Put that quick. in there. Would you mind? No. Uh, so very much appreciate Kelly. Thank you for all your comments. This has been so engaging. I appreciate it. And hopefully this is a bit different than some of the topics that we normally see at an education conference. So I look forward to hearing more.